All righty. Welcome, everybody, to Katy Community Church. Glad you're with us today. Hope you had a good week this past week. Let's begin, as we always do, with the word of prayer, which gives us each the opportunity to examine ourselves, make sure that we're in fellowship with God and prepared for the teaching of his word today by using the rebound technique, if necessary, which says, if we will confess our sins, this is in 1 John 1, 9, if we will confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege that we enjoy, the freedom that we have to be able to meet together and study your word. As always, Father, we pray that you'll help us today with our understanding of what's being taught and our applica application to our individual lives so that we may continue to grow in the grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. All right, we're on lesson two of the triumphs of faith. Last week, we introduced the subject and looked at uh, the faith of Abel, of all people. Um, today, we want to look at two other great believers from the Old Testament, uh, a man by the name of Enoch and also Noah, who you probably well know. Uh, don't worry, ladies. Uh, the Holy Spirit didn't leave uh, the ladies out in this list of great believers of faith. Uh, we'll be coming up and we'll see some great women in the Old Testament too had a, who had a great deal of faith and served God faithfully. Well, in verse 5 of Hebrews chapter 11, this is the faith chapter. So it begins in verse 5 of Hebrews 11 by saying, By faith Enoch was taken up so that he would not see death. He was not found because God took him up. For before he was taken up, he was attested to have been pleasing to God. By faith in this case means Enoch was a faithful believer. He was faithful in learning Bible doctrine as it was communicated or revealed to him by God at that time. Now, remember, the source of the prophet's message in the Old Testament came in various ways. They didn't have the completed canon of Scripture, the Bible, like we have. But they still had the Word of God, which is Bible doctrine. So the source of their the prophet's message came from conversations directly with God, sometimes in dreams, visions, sometimes angelic teaching. So Enoch acted upon this doctrine that he had by not only becoming a great believer, but he became a great communicator of doctrine as a prophet, a person who functioned as a prophet in the Old Testament, communicated Bible doctrine, and often, as we've studied before, spoke of future events. They not only foretold, they also foretold. So because of Enoch's faithful service, God, in his grace, magnificently chose to transfer Enoch to heaven without experiencing death. Pretty amazing, really, when you think about it. Uh, Genesis chapter 5, verses 21 through 24, give us commentary on Enoch so uh, as to his faithfulness to God. Enoch was a prophet of God as a spiritually mature believer during the period of history in which he lived. The phrase attested to have been pleasing to God means Enoch was a righteous man who consistently followed God's instructions for his life. Here's what it says in Genesis chapter 5, verses 21 through 24. Now Enoch lived 65 years and fathered Methuselah. Y'all have all heard of Methuselah, the oldest man in the Bible to ever live. Then Enoch walked with God 300 years after he fathered Methuselah. 
and he fathered other sons and daughters. So all the days of Enoch were 365 years. Once again, in verse 24, Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. I like the way that says that. For he was not, God took him. Enoch is a great example in the faith chapter, Hebrews chapter 11, of a man who was faithful to God to the point that God did not even allow him to experience physical death and took him directly to heaven. In Jude chapter 14, uh, not chapter 14, verse 14, remember Jude's only one chapter, uh, Jude 14 helps us understand who Enoch was and why he was mentioned in this list of faithful believers. The prophecies of future events given by Enoch dealt with apostasy in the future tribulation. Remember, the church age was a mystery to these Old Testament prophets. They looked down the corridors of history through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, but the church age was like a valley that they couldn't see into. They saw right over it. So when they prophesied of future events, they prophesied of the tribulation and the millennium. And remember, the tribulation is the last seven years of the age of Israel. So when these men were prophesying, they were prophesying about future events. In the case of Enoch, he, was, he prophesied about the future apostasy that will be a reality during the period of the tribulation and the coming of Jesus Christ at the end of the tribulation he also spoke of. So Enoch spoke of the period of the tribulation with emphasis on the second coming of Christ where there would be one of the greatest judgments in the history against apostasy. Because remember, who is ruling and reigning here on this earth during this period called the tribulation? The first three and a half years are a time of peace. In the middle of the tribulation, after three and a half years, the Antichrist becomes, not becomes, but uh, demonstrates his evil intent all along. His tactic was to make peace with the world and get everyone believing that he had brought peace to the world, and there would be no more fighting and wars and so forth. But in the middle of the tribulation, he turns completely around and begins to persecute, especially the Jews, but also the rest of the world. And so there is judgment that is coming upon him when this happens because of the apostasy. Remember, he also sets up the false prophet who is the religion of the tribulation, which is a false apostate religion. And literally, his goal is to cause the entire human world to worship him as God. So Enoch warned the apostate about the apostates early in history. He was not, he was only the seventh generation from removed from, uh, from Adam from the original man. And he looked into the future to illustrate this judgment on apostasy. Here's what it says in Jude chapter, I, I put chapter one, there's only one chapter, 14 through 15. It was also about these people, these apostate teachers that Jude had been talking about in the previous verses, that Enoch in the, uh, the seventh generation from Adam prophesied saying, Behold, the Lord has come with many thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment upon all who are the holy ones. That's the believers. The church age believers will be coming with him to execute judgment upon all and to convict all the ungodly <laughs> of their ungodly deeds, which they have done in an ungodly way and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. We have a group of ungodly people. 
Ungodly means you're against God, obviously. And so Enoch was the man that God chose to prophesy about those coming events. What was the purpose of revealing that information to the Jewish race and to the world as it was at that time? It was, to, it was a wake-up call. Enoch was a prophet, and that's what the prophet's job was primarily, was to give a wake-up call to the nations about God and his coming Messiah, the anointed one, Jesus Christ. So when they prophesied about these terrible events in, in the future, it was so that these people would realize that there is a judgment coming if you don't follow God. First believe in his coming Messiah, Jesus Christ, as your Savior. They called him, of course, in the Old Testament, Jehovah. Jehovah is the second person of the Trinity. He is Jesus Christ, the same person who appeared in the Old Testament in what we call theophanies. Those are pre-incarnate appearances of Jesus Christ before he came in the flesh. So Enoch was used by God to prophesy about coming events in an attempt to give a wake-up call to these nations. Verse 6 says, and without faith it is impossible to please him, to please God. For the one who comes to God must believe that he exists and he proves to be the one, capital O, who rewards those who seek him. Now, once again, faith here is believing Bible doctrine, believing the word of God. Pleasing God is based on consistent and persistent positive volition toward Bible doctrine. That's what Enoch had. That's what Abel had. That's what these other great believers in the faith chapter of Hebrews 11, that's what they did. They believed God's message. What's God's message? It's Bible doctrine. What is Bible doctrine? The teaching of God. We just happen to have it in a completed canon, a book that is made up actually of 66 books inspired by God, the Holy Spirit, we call the Bible. So none of us can please God without believing, without faith, and applying the doctrine that's in our soul. So if you truly want to please God, and you should, as a believer in Jesus Christ, realizing what all God has done for us, he sent his only son to this world to take on flesh and to suffer and to die on a cross to pay the penalty for our sin. What greater love can that be than God's love for us to send his only son to die on the cross and pay for our sins? And the wonderful thing about that is that he doesn't ask us to do anything other than believe it. He doesn't ask us to reform our lives. He doesn't ask us to join a certain church or denomination. He doesn't ask us to do thousands of, of human good works. None of that is part of salvation. Jesus Christ made the complete sacrifice for sin. Therefore, no more sacrifice is necessary from anyone. All we do is apply our faith, and that's what faith is all about. Faith is believing. Faith is believing what God has revealed to us in his word regarding his son and the plan of salvation. So when you put your faith in Jesus Christ, you are saying, in effect, I believe that Jesus Christ was sufficient for the payment of my sin. If I add works to my salvation, that I have to do something in order to gain my salvation or earn my salvation, then what I'm saying, and according to the book of Hebrews, by the way, is that I don't believe that the sacrifice that Christ made for me on the cross was satisfactory to make 
the payment for my sin, which is blasphemous. Christ made the complete sacrifice. All we do is believe it. We apply our faith. So this goes on to say here, he who comes to God, that refers to believers who want to know God. Remember, God doesn't coerce us. He doesn't force us to believe him. He doesn't force us to believe in his son, Jesus Christ. He doesn't force us to believe in his word and, and live our spiritual life. God never forces us to do anything. He leaves that decision up to us, to our own personal volition. So he who comes to God refers to believers who want to know him and to occupy themselves with the person of Jesus Christ. Occupation with the person of Christ means that we are fully aware of Christ in every area of our lives and that we are staying in fellowship with him a maximum amount of time. It means that we are thinking the way Christ thought, divine viewpoint thinking, based on what? not based on Satan's world system or what we learned in college, but based on the word of God, the doctrine in our soul, the knowledge of his word that we have stored in our soul. So it means we're thinking divine viewpoint banks based on our knowledge of his word and that we have no higher goal in our life than to bring honor and glory to Christ, Jesus Christ, our Savior, in our thoughts, in our attitudes, in our words, in our actions. This should be our goal as believers. Our desire should always be to saturate our minds, our souls, with his word. We have great knowledge. If you've been with us any period of time here at Katy Community Church, your soul is saturated with his word, with the word of God, but it doesn't end there. Regardless of how far we've advanced in our spiritual life, we never stop growing. We never have the maximum amount of doctrine in our soul that is available to us. There's so much more that we can learn and learn how to use in our daily lives. So we must believe that he is means an exercise our faith in who God is and what our relation with relationship with him is like. What is your relationship with God like? What's your spiritual life like? That is between you and God. It's no one else's business. We have no uh, authority or command to interfere with your spiritual life or to stick our nose into your business, that's your decision. As a maturing believer, you are to take control of your own spiritual life. That means that you discipline yourself to make sure that you're spending time in God's Word, not just on Sunday, not just on Wednesday night, but during the week. As you have time, you can set aside time spent in studying God's word. We have all the resources that we need. So our desire should always be to saturate and continue to saturate our God, our souls with the word of God, because that's what keeps us going as believers. That's what keeps us on track. That what, what, that's what keeps us glorifying our Savior, Jesus Christ. So we have to believe that God is who he says he is and exercise our faith at, uh, within the realm of the divine dinosphere. Are you living in God's power system? We must believe, therefore, means to be convinced of the truth of Bible doctrine to the point that you know the effectiveness of Bible doctrine in your life. Do you know? Have you experienced the effect of taking in doctrine on a consistent basis and then applying that to the circumstances of your life? 
Have you seen it work? Have you seen it resolve problems in your life? You should. You should have already been at that point in your life where doctrine works for you because that's the reason we come together is to learn God's word so that we can use God's word to glorify God. And the only way we can do that is by using the doctrine. You know, that's what the book of James tells us to be doers of the word and not just hearers only. What are the, what's a doer? A doer is the one who uses or applies the word of God to their daily lives so that they can be the representative that God wants them to be while they're here on this earth. How are you representing Jesus Christ? Do your words represent Jesus Christ? Does your attitude towards others and towards life reflect the character of Jesus Christ? Do your actions reflect the character of Jesus Christ? That's what faith is all about. Faith is believing God's word. And without believing God's word, it is impossible to please God. Do you want to please God? Do you want to hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant, when you stand before the Lord Jesus Christ at the judgment seat of Christ? I'm sure you do. I know I do. So you're a member of the royal family of God. You are royalty. You are spiritual royalty as a believer in Jesus Christ. Your life now has meaning and purpose, and the Word of God has defined God's plan for your life. What your objectives should be in life are defined in the Word of God. Therefore, you must apply, or excuse me, comply with his instructions if you're going to please him and be rewarded with divine blessings by him. That's why it says he's the one who rewards those who seek him. Remember, God does not coerce you into doing anything. Those that seek him are the ones who are going to be rewarded in eternity. You're going to have many blessings here on this earth. All believers are blessed by God. But there are greater blessings that are available to every one of us. And you should desire those. Because by desiring the blessings from God, you are pleasing God. God is pleased and honored when he can pour out blessings into your life. Do you realize that? That honors God. Why? Because you've been living your spiritual life. You've been increasing your capacity to receive blessing from God by living your spiritual life. Are you perfect? Of course not. None of us are. We all have a sin nature and we all commit sin. But we have a solution and you know the solution. We mention it when we start Bible class every time. It's the rebound technique. It's keeping short accounts. When you realize you've committed a sin through your speech, through your thoughts, through your actions, through your attitude, whatever it may be, you just simply confess that. You name it. You admit it. You acknowledge it to God. And the moment that the, immediately when you do that, God forgives you and cleanses you from all other sins, perhaps that you've forgotten or that you haven't confessed up to that point. They're forgiven. That's grace. That's God's grace. It's undeserved. We don't deserve that, but God in his grace gives us the solution so that we can stay in fellowship with him a maximum amount of time. And by staying in fellowship with him, we're able to utilize the doctrine that's in our soul to live our spiritual lives. That's what these faithful believers did in the Old Testament. They didn't have near the amount of information that we have about God's plan for the human race and for us specifically 
as believers in the church age. But wow, these people were faithful to God. So here we come to Noah. And you know the story. You may have seen the movie or seen something on TV or learned something in Sunday school, a lot of which is not totally accurate. But verse 7 says, By faith, Noah, being warned by God about things not yet seen, in reverence, prepared an ark for the salvation of his household by which he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness, which is according to faith. Now, as I said, most of us know this story about Noah and the flood, but there is a tremendous amount of doctrine and analogy associated with this story. In this story, we find several doctrines. We find the doctrine of theology, which is the doctrine of God. We see Christology, the doctrine of Christ, and soteriology, which is the doctrine of salvation. Satan and his demons were hard at work just prior to the flood, if you read Genesis chapter 6. And they were attempting to spoil the plan of God. That's what Satan has always done and will continue to do. He wants to thwart. I don't know if that's a word we use a lot, but that's what he wants to do. He wants to destroy the plan of God. And it began very early on. It began in the Garden of Eden. But now we're several hundred years later and he's still at work, and we see his work in the human race when we study about Noah and the flood. So Satan and his demons were hard at work prior to the flood, attempting to spoil the plan of God. It was Satan's goal to stop the humanity of Christ from ever being born or to corrupt the entire human race so that Christ could not be true humanity if he was born. Now, many believers have no clue as to the significance of the humanity of Christ and why Christ had to become a man by means of a virgin birth. But we understand it. We know why Christ had to become a human being because he had to be the one that was qualified to go to the cross and make the payment for our sins. Because if we pay for our own sins, what is our final destination? The lake of fire. We're going to hell. But Christ had to come and take on humanity in order to fulfill the plan of God for salvation for the human race. And he had to be born of a virgin. You know why? You remember why he had to be born of a virgin? So that he would not have Adam's original sin which is imputed to every human being at birth. He would not have a sin nature because the sin nature is passed down genetically from the father to the child. Christ did not have a human father. Therefore, he had no sin nature. Therefore, he could not have Adam's original sin because Adam's original sin is imputed to you know, to the sin nature. So Christ was born spiritually alive and, and physically alive without a sin nature, without Adam's original sin. And he was able throughout his life here on this earth never to commit a personal sin. But he had to be born of a virgin. So the very first gospel message in the Bible is found actually in Genesis 3.15. It's the seed of the woman and places the emphasis on Christ's humanity and on the virgin birth. Now, why am I telling you this? I'm telling you this because Satan was attempting to keep Christ from being true humanity. While many Christians do not understand the importance of the humanity of Christ, Satan does and always has. 
Satan made many specific attacks on the humanity of Christ in an attempt to keep him from coming into the world. Because if Jesus Christ was prevented from coming into the world, then there would be no salvation. Now, Jesus Christ is God, right? Second person of the Trinity, co-equal, co-eternal with God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. But he is unique because he is also true humanity. So he has an affinity with God and he has affinity with us as human beings. In his deity, Jesus Christ is eternal life and eternal life cannot die. He is immutable. He can't change. He is sovereign and not subject to death. And yet the only way for man's salvation is the cross. And so Christ had to become true humanity, which he did, of course. And because it is the humanity of Christ that would be sacrificed on the cross, he would die spiritually on the cross as the payment for our spiritual death, which we all are born with. And then he would die physically and come back from the dead and overcome spirit or physical death so that we too could be resurrected. So only the humanity of Christ could bear the sins of the world through his substitutionary spiritual death on the cross. <clears throat> so he had to be a human being. I said all of that to tell you that we can see Satan's attack of Christ in Genesis 6, which was a, de a demonic infiltration into humanity, attempting to destroy it as God had created it. This was the greatest attack ever made on our salvation. What happened? Well, angels infiltrated the human race and began to cohabitate with human women, corrupting the human race as it was at that time. You may have heard of the term Nephtalene. Nephtalene is that super creature that was part angel and part God. This is Genesis chapter 6. You can read it for yourself. But Satan's attack was so successful that the line by which Jesus Christ would come into the world was narrowed down to a family of eight, the family of Noah. That's why he's mentioned here because of his faithfulness. Had it not been for the flood, the attack upon the humanity, upon humanity and the human race would have been entirely successful <clears throat> since there would have been no true humanity left in the human race. So all of the human race would have been part human and part demon, basically. Noah took the proper action, even though he was in the minority with him and his family, a total of eight people. Excuse me just one second. Noah received a message from God about the termination of civilization. That's what our verse said. He was notified. The ship that Noah constructed was his action regarding the warning he received. So God told him to build a boat build an ark. This information came to Noah at least 120 years before the flood, according to Genesis chapter 6, verse 3. So this verse says, once again, by faith Noah, being warned by God about things yet not seen about the flood, in reverence, in awe of God, in reverence of God, prepared an ark for the salvation of his household. Now, that took a great amount of faith. It means Noah respected and reverenced God and accepted his instructions to build before the rain came. Now, here's the amazing thing. It had never rained before. 
the water, the, the earth was watered by waters coming up through the earth. It had never rained. But the ship that Noah constructed was his action regarding the warning. It, it was an action of his faith, of believing God, even though it seemed preposterous, I'm sure, to him. But he was going to do what God told him to do. And it's the same thing with us in our lives. Sometimes things don't seem quite right. Or can I really do that? Can I accomplish that? Is that really what God wants me to do? Well, if God wants you to do something and he's leading you to do that, he's going to provide everything that you need in order to accomplish that. And it's the same way in the life of Noah. He gave him all the tools he needed. And what did Noah do? Noah just simply applied his faith to what he knew about God, about what he had learned about God, the doctrine that was in his soul. So it took a lot of faith and a lot of faithfulness on the part of Noah and his son to construct the ark. Now, we must remember that while Noah and his sons were building the ark, the rest of the world was becoming increasingly corrupt around him. Fallen angels, as I said, had infiltrated the human race, and a new evil race was about to completely corrupt it, corrupt the human race. Here's what it says in Genesis chapter 6, verses 5 through 7. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of mankind was great on the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of their hearts was only evil continually. So the Lord was sorry that he had made mankind on the earth and he was grieved in his heart. Then the Lord said, I will wipe out mankind whom I have created from the face of the land, mankind and animals as well and crawling things and the birds of the sky, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Isn't that what we want to hear? But Stan found favor favor in the eyes of the Lord. Just insert your name there. Found favor in the eyes of the Lord. God can use one faithful and obedient person like yourself to change the course of history according to his plan just like he did with Noah. And the only way you can please God is by faith, by believing Bible doctrine, by believing God and his word and applying that on a consistent basis, just like these great men of faith did, like Enoch did, like Noah did. It was Noah's faith in God and his word that turned around the course of history and staved off the attack of Satan against the humanity of Christ. Had it not been for one faithful man, then the hum human race would have been corrupted. But God knew Noah and found Noah to be faithful, to be a righteous man that he could trust. And Noah and his family were saved from destruction and a new race began, a pure race from which would come the Lord Jesus Christ in his humanity to die on the cross and pay the penalty for your sin so that you could have eternal life. I think these stories, I don't know about you, but they inspire me to be faithful to my Savior, to be faithful to live a life before others so that they can see Christ in me 
and so that I can have the opportunity to open my mouth and tell them about Jesus Christ and find out, have a conversation. Do you know for sure you're going to heaven? If you don't, let me explain it to you. It's simple. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. It's that simple. Believe. Notice Jesus was the one who said this. If good works were part of salvation or any other factor, Jesus would have said so. He would have said, for God so loved the world that whoever believes in him and goes to church on a regular basis, gives money, is baptized with water, does good work, he would have listed them. He wouldn't keep that information from us. He said it's simple. That's the gospel. John 3.16 is the gospel. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. You'll have eternal life. And believing in him means you believe who he is and what he did on the cross to pay for your sins. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for these great examples from the Old Testament of people who were faithful to you. In this case that we looked at today, the great man Enoch, who was taken to heaven without dying, and this wonderful man Noah and his family who were used by you to keep Satan and his demonic army from infiltrating the earth to the point where Noah and his family would have been less than human. You preserve humanity so our Savior could come and pay the penalty for our sins, and we're so, so thankful for that. Help us to be cognizant of that in our daily lives so that we represent our Savior Jesus Christ to this world in which we live which is without him and which is being corrupted more and more day by day by Satan and his evil world system. Help us to be strong, apply doctrine, learn doctrine on a consistent basis. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, everybody.